while Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus on more of the humanity of Christ, John focuses on the deity of Christ. Matthew and Luke have a genealogy of the humanity of Christ. Matthew going back to Abraham, Luke going back to Adam. But John begins even before that, right? He goes back to the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John doesn't start with the humanity of Christ. John starts with the deity of Christ. That in the beginning, well, of course, we can't even think outside of time. So John puts it in reference to time. In the beginning... And so, Jesus Christ, who was the Word, was in fellowship with God the Father. God the Son was in fellowship with God the Father from the very beginning, from eternity past. John, the son of Zebedee, is the author of the book of John. Based upon Old Testament usage, we believe he was Jewish. Polycarp, uh, who lived around 69 to 155 AD, this is still in the life of John, right, the author. Polycarp was a student of John's, and he told his student, Irenaeus, that John the Apostle was the author of this gospel. So that's pretty strong evidence, right? You have the second generation who's taught by someone who was taught by John. And so John was an eyewitness to the life and ministry of Christ. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 14. He refers to Jesus, God the Son, as the Word, And in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, I saw him. I saw the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to share that with you. I'm an eyewitness of this life. From distance to nearness, John lists these items. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we knew existed which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and which we have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life, concerning that which produces life, concerning Jesus Christ, the incarnate word. And so John says, that which I knew existed, but not only what I knew, but what I heard from, which I saw, which I saw very uh, carefully and closely beheld, and that which I actually touched and embraced. I believe it's written around 85 to 95 AD. This would be the last of the four Gospels. It was not one of the synoptic Gospels, because it has unique material, over 90% unique material, and we believe John wrote it in his older years, and Polycarp indicates that. This is one of the most significant archaeological discoveries concerning the Gospel of John. Why is that? Well, you see... In 1844, back in 1844, um, an essay was released by a theologian, a liberal theologian, by the name of Bauer, F.C. Bauer, and it was published. In it, Bauer argued that John's gospel could not be dated any earlier than A.D. 160, and probably closer to A.D. 170. That would mean that John the Apostle of Christ did not write it. That's what this particular theologian, this particular liberal scholar is trying to argue. That the Gospel of John would not have been written until A.D. 170, long after he would have died. Well, this manuscript is referred to as P52. They document it as Papyrus 52. But it's also called the John Rylands document because because it's in uh, Manchester, in the John Rylands Library in England at the Manchester University. This was discovered down in Egypt, way down here where the star is. But it's believed to originally be written up in the north star there in Ephesus. Okay, so it took, it got all the way down to Egypt by copying it and passing it on. It was so important of a document that it was copied and passed on, copied, passed on, copied, passed on, copied, passed on. But this discovery completely destroyed Bauer's argument that John's gospel was written in A.D. 170. Let me read Dan Wallace. Concerning this discovery of P52, of this papyrus, he says, 90 years after Bauer first published his thesis on John, a young doctoral student studying at Manchester University 
discovered this papyrus in a scrap of papyruses. He found it in the John Ryland's library. It was a fragment. It's about two and a half inches by three and a half inches, but its importance far outweighs its size. He recognized that this fragment was that of John's gospel. It was chapter 18, verses 31 to 33 on one side, and chapter 18, verses 37 and 38 on the other. He sent the photographs of the fragment to three of the leading papyrologists in Europe. Each one reported independently that this fragment should be dated between A.D. 100 and A.D. 150. A fourth scholar disagreed. He argued that the fragment should be dated in the 90s of the first century. This tiny fragment of John's Gospel rocked the scholarly near-consensus world at the time, for it's impossible for a copy to be written before the original text is produced. It effectively sent two tons of German scholarship to the flames. This manuscript must have been written when the ink on the original text was barely dry. In other words, this is the earliest manuscript discovered, which authenticates in what we already know to be true, that John the Apostle wrote it, 85 to 95. And if this manuscript found all the way down in Egypt was discovered, it must have been... <laughs> a copy of the original. It's not the original. But in order for that to occur and get all the way down to Egypt, it takes time. And so this discovery uh, destroyed German scholarship previous to that that tried to say John the Apostle could never have written the book bearing his name. Important discovery, P52, the John Rylands manuscript. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John says, this is why I recorded these miracle narratives. Verse 30, Jesus did many other miracle signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But John says, the ones I've recorded, the reason I recorded them was to cause people to recognize Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And so this is John's stated purpose for an unbelieving audience. So he certainly was writing to an unbelieving audience, but as well, we have significant importance for believers too. The riches of the Gospel of John is significant. And although often we do give the Gospel of John to new believers or seeking believers, and rightly so, because John intended it to be read by those seeking. So the central theme of belief is very important in the Gospel of John, uh, and he writes in such a way a persuasive way that people would believe. Different phases of ministry are noted um, throughout the Gospel of John, from the beginning to a point where there is a rejection by the Jewish nation, specifically through the Jewish religious leaders, and then a movement towards the cross after that, where Jesus will pay the penalty for the sins of the world, and where Jesus will be rejected, where he will be betrayed by his own disciples, or his disciples will flee apart from John. We see a chronological sequence that follows the Jewish feasts. And so the Jewish feasts are used by John as a key structural component to this great gospel account. Also, geographical locations are mentioned regularly. And so as Jesus moves and as uh, his, along with his disciples, the geographical locations are identified. Personal conversations are highlighted in John's Gospel. In fact, John 3, a couple of personal conversations that are important. <laughs> uh, not, they are all important, but uh, ones that we know very well, that of the discussion with Nicodemus, right? You must be born again, which is the context for the probably the most famous verse in the Bible, right? John 3, 16. That's the context, the conversation between Jesus and and Nicodemus. Number six is unique prologue. You can, that's a nice big word, unique introduction, right? John starts the gospel in a very unique way. He doesn't start with a genealogy like Matthew or like Luke. He starts with this very uh, beautiful and theological introduction. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Number seven, there are asides, parenthetical statements. And so he gives a narrative account, but he stops in the middle of the narratives several times to explain in a parenthetical statement to explain 
uh, something that's important for a readership that may not be familiar with that story, may not be familiar with that Jewish custom. Uh, an example um, is with Judas. On many times that we have a parenthetical statement, this one is not so much something they didn't know, but it was intended by John to emphasize Judas, parentheses, the one who betrayed Jesus. Based upon what you define a parenthetical statement, uh, some as few as 59, which is a lot still, all the way up to 193. So this is significant, a literary feature that John uses uh, to help the audience understand uh, some things that uh, might not have been told in a typical narrative. He gives some background information. The theme, belief in Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. I believe his purpose of writing the gospel account is to motivate all men to believe in Jesus by demonstrating that he is the Christ, the Son of God. In my introduction to John, I quote uh, Kostenberger, and I think he's right here. Although John's emphasis is on belief, right? This is not just a book for unbelievers, right? There's huge theological significance and truth that helps the unbeliever as well. Uh, Kostenberger rightly points out, he says, John's gospel, together with the book of Romans, may well be considered the enduring twin towers of New Testament theology. The message statement. Since Jesus Christ is proven to be the Son of God, all mankind should be motivated to believe in him and inherit eternal life. John is providing an apology. An apology is not to ask for forgiveness, to say you're sorry for something. Apology is a defense for the faith. Some particular characteristics common in the Gospels, they include the comments about John the Baptist, the call of the disciples are recorded by John, as well as the Synoptic Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000, John's Gospel includes, uh, Peter's confession, John's Gospel includes, the triumphal entry, John's Gospel includes. The Last Supper narrative, John's Gospel includes. Parts of the uh, Passion narrative, John's Gospel includes. So although John's Gospel is 93% unique, the Synoptic Gospels are much different. The, John's Gospel in, emphasizes unique components that the Synoptic Gospels do not. These are so important, not in John's Gospel. Jesus' genealogy, his birth... Jesus' birth, um, it's recorded in Matthew and Luke. John did not see the need to emphasize Jesus' birth because of Matthew and Luke's inclusion of it. Instead, he emphasizes Jesus' eternality, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Not in John is the baptism account, the temptation account, the transfiguration of Jesus, the time in Gethsemane, and the ascension. So these are things that you might think are very important, which they are, but because John knew they were included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, did not see the need. Uh, And as we read in chapter 21, John says, if I recorded everything, uh, the life of Jesus, his works, his teachings, his miracles, not any book could contain, not any amount of books could contain all that is in. So John includes what he thinks is most important for his purpose a theological purpose, emphasizing the deity of Christ. The general focus of Jesus' ministry, uh, he stresses ministry in Jerusalem, is especially focused on this, the city of Jerusalem, the time of ministry in Jerusalem, and around the Jewish feasts. And as already mentioned, also ministry to personal people, to per, in personal conversations, to his disciples and individuals. It's interesting that although Jesus taught in parables, he he taught many parables, there are none included in John's Gospel. Again, Matthew includes a lot of them, right? Matthew includes many parables relating to the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of heaven, as he would say it in Matthew's Gospel. But um, the parables uh, are important, but Matthew included so many. John uh, felt the need was not for him to include it in his gospel account. Many great sermons and discourses are included. Some of those include a discourse on the new birth, the water of life, the bread of life, the light of the world, Jesus being the good shepherd, the upper room discourse. So there's a lot of teachings in John's gospel, significant 
theological teachings uh, that are not found in the other Gospels, or not found in the Synoptic Gospels. Only this Gospel contains Jesus' prayer in the upper room, his prayer for his disciples. And it's interesting that this Gospel, and helpful that this Gospel, John records the teaching of Jesus concerning the Holy Spirit. In John 14 through 16, he talks about the Comforter that Jesus will send, who will teach them, instruct them, who will come alongside them, who will assist them, who will bring to their memories the things that Jesus had taught them. And so we learn more about the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. That's very important, this section, chapter 14 through 16, on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Some great themes. Again, the word believe is used 98 times in the Gospel of John. Belief is important in John's narrative. He's calling people to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing they might have eternal life. He talks about life, talks about light versus darkness, talks about abiding. These are common themes that are found in John's Gospel, which, by the way, are also found in John's epistles. First John especially, abiding, light versus darkness. We've got these metaphors that, Jesus, that John talks about the, the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. That's why it's not good to be in the darkness. Nicodemus came at night. Judas went into the night. John uses these pictures to emphasize characters and are not positive characters if you are a person of the darkness or if you meet at night. There are... Several I am statements, what's famously known as the ego a me, ego meaning I, and a me meaning I am. It's really a repetition, right? In the Jewish mind, if you said I am, you would think back to Exodus. You would think back to, to uh, Moses and his interaction with Pharaoh, right? I am sent me. Well, John records this construction very often, ego a me, I, I am. Speaking of Jesus, in the Jewish mind would think back to this statement, especially their familiarity with the Septuagint. I am sent me. Jesus is the I am, the beginning and the end. And he uses this construction, ego a me, in several discourses. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the true vine. These are all uh, significant uh, sermons, metaphors that Jesus uses to help instruct his followers about his nature, about his character. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ego a me is repetitive for emphasis. I, I am. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us for this class hour. My prayer is that this course and these accompanying materials will be a great resource for you as you seek to know the Word of God better and to know the God of the Word better. Maybe you know someone that would benefit greatly from investing a year of their lives to study the Word of God at our Institute. Maybe you are that person. I want to invite you to learn more information about the Word of Life Hungry Bible Institute at our website. This year we have students who have come from 15 different countries studying in the English language. And we have guest teachers who fly in from all over the world, coming from some, but not limited to, Dallas Theological Seminary, Appalachian Bible College, Tyndale Seminary, Cedarville University, and the Institute of Bible Extension in Jerusalem, Israel. Additionally, we have veteran pastors and Christian leaders who fly here to serve with us as our adjunct faculty. And as a ministry, we are committed to providing this training at a cost within the reach of every Christian because we want to help Christians establish a solid biblical foundation upon which they can build a bright future for the glory of God.